Before we really begin this video, I really want to give a bit of a backstory behind myself and and these books, particularly the trilogy in which I'm going to kind of talk about uh, to sort of set set things up. But I have not read any of these books since I was, I believe, a sophomore and junior in high school. And I really have to thank my English teacher, Mr. Sorocek, who happened to have a copy of The Killer Angels within his giant library that he used to have in his room. And he let me borrow the book and let me read it and digest it. And I fell in love with The Killer Angels. That was by Michael Shera, And his son would write the two subsequent books. And of course, The Killer Angels was... Gettysburg, about the Battle of Gettysburg, an excellently written book. I want to revisit these because, well, I took a couple years ago, I, I took a trip to Gettysburg, and that was my first time I ever went to Gettysburg, and that sort of re-spurred a lot of my interest in that area. Jeff Shera is my favorite author overall. No one writes historical fiction like that man does. Just, I can't think of anyone, and I adore it. It's, it's really unique what he does. Like, The Killer Angels was really unique when Michael Shera wrote it, and Jeff Shera has continued that legacy rather successfully, in my opinion. Now, having reread The Killer Angels and Gods and Generals, I've concluded the trilogy with um, The Last Full Measure, and I just finished it last week. The fact that I'm still wrapping my brain around The la Last Full Measure and I haven't been able to stop thinking about it, I think says a lot. No joke, this is the greatest book I have ever read. And I read a lot. The Last Full Measure is phenomenal. I actually wish Jeff Shera would return to this style. It's it's so full of raw emotional elements. It's quite relatable. It makes these characters very relatable. Uh, and it brings to life what history textbooks simply cannot. They can try, but they just can't because they're not trying to tell a story they're trying to tell history jeff sher is trying to tell a story and because of that you can't really look at his books in particular the last full measure you can't really look at it as a history book in of itself because there are indeed some fake characters most notably is buster kilrain uh who was a carryover from michael shara's uh the killer angels his his war in the west series has one character in particular who is completely fictitious and is kind of an amalgamation uh, soldier and stuff like that it's an epic story befitting the eastern campaign pains and arguably the darkest moments in American history. Gods and Generals was ama was an amazing book too. But there were several moments within Gods and Generals where I wish Jeff Shera kind of focused on something that he just chose not to. Most notably the battles. The prime example of this and let me tell you it is the only thing in the movie does better than Jeff Shera's book uh, is Jackson at Manassas. That isn't in the book at all. We just hear about it offhand from Lee's perspective. Jeff Shera makes Jackson one of the main characters. I mean, out of the four, he's the, the least prominent one, but he's one of our main POV characters. And you have an opportunity there to really show that this war is not going to be pretty. This war is going to be awful. And do that at the Battle of Manassas or the Battle of Bull Run. And they don't show it. But it's almost like the criticisms that Shera took with Gods and Generals, that being his first book, and he ran with it within the last full measure. Because the quality of writing, genuinely, between Gods and Generals and the last full measure improves tenfold. And I already liked Gods and Generals a lot. One of the big reasons why I think the last full measure works so well is that whenever the book begins to get a little too slow, the pacing really slows itself down and almost starts getting bogged down under it, it, the own weight of the story that it's trying to tell, suddenly he'll add some action. He'll add a battle sequence. And this keeps the pacing wonderful. It, it, the, the book just keeps flowing, which isn't necessarily the case in Gods and Generals. And it's not too bogged down in too many historical details like his new Civil War quadrilogy, I should say. That is the problem that plagues Jeff Shera's new War in the West series. Once in a while, a very dramatic scene will shift perspective to a character that we literally have no idea who they are. And the most prominent example I can think of that in his work is this novel here to the last man. I do not like this book. I genuinely think that this is a bad book because of the structuring. You know, having a nameless private or a soldier appear here and there to to depict the sequence. You know, I don't have a problem with that. It's when 
one of these random nobody characters that we have no idea really who they are. They haven't appeared anywhere else in the book prior to that moment. And they are what is supposed to carry an emotional and dramatic scene I have issues with. In Gods and Generals, we have Williams Barksdale for a scene, which is about his defense of Fredericksburg as the Union was crossing the river. He was the one that was put in charge of uh, the defense of the Rappahannock and stuff like that. Not a character at all beforehand. In this book, A Blaze for Glory, uh, which is about the Battle of Shiloh, uh, we have, what was his name? Uh, General Benjamin Prentice. Uh, which is a very dramatic part of the battle. Don't get me wrong. But the the issue is, is that we only meet him in his final moments, in the final moments of that battle uh, near the hornet's nest. And what should have happened is in the first half of the book, somewhere in there, you should have established him as a genuine character, get in his head two or three times. So that way, when we get to the battle scene itself, with him surrendering, there is emotional weight to this. We give more of a damn of who he is and, and makes the book flow more naturally as a narrative. Again, a lot of my cr criticisms of Jeff Shera are his structure. How he tells his story is far more of the problem than necessarily the writing itself. But none of these problems are really anything that present themselves too much in The Last Full Measure or Gods and Generals. In particular, The Last Full Measure, it's hardly there at all. The book is huge in scope. It is the definition of an epic, uh, and it never loses sight of its three primary characters. It never gets too bogged down. Its three main characters are Grant, Lee, and Chamberlain. And it jumps to other characters as well, most notably Longstreet, A.P. Hill, and Stuart. But what makes that difference than like my criticism of like a blaze of glory and stuff like that is that when we jump into the heads of these characters, we've had now three books of getting to know who they are. Granted, from usually somebody else's point of view, but they're characters that keep appearing nonetheless. So we give a damn about who they are. Longstreet is even a main POV. In The Killer Angels, which again wasn't written by Jeff Scherer about his father, so we do know how he kind of thinks. And so when we jump into his character during the into his head during the Battle of the Wilderness, it's not like it's come out of left field. We know who he is, we know what he's going to do, and we know how he's going to act. We care. Longstreet, uh, you know, being wounded by his own men. Uh, for example, during the Battle of the Wilderness, it plays into Lee's character. It's not just a random scene. Lee being the POV right after, you feel his fear of losing his war horse. In the area that Jackson, too, had been shot, and not only shot, but shot by his own men, so has Longstreet. Is he going to be plagued by losing... Is he going to be... Is he going to lose his war horse? You know, his most capable commander by this point in the war, is he about to lose him? And you feel it plague on Lee. Like, there's no tomorrow. That genuine concern. And both are really well written and presented, by the way. Both the death of Jackson getting shot and also Longstreet. And they're, they almost parallel each other in several ways. And it's, and it's really wonderfully done. And I applaud Jeff Scherer for it. In fact, the Battle of the Wilderness scene, I would argue, is actually one of the best depictions of a Civil War battle ever written. In terms of historical fiction. We have the classic lead to the rear his men screaming Lee to the rear. That is an amazing moment. I remember when I was reading that, I was actually getting chills reading this. And it's also a good example of a beginning of an arc for Lee and how Jeff Shera writes Lee going from that point forward. That is something that we saw begin in Gods and Generals that it seems like Jeff Shera has perfected by the time we get to the last full measure. In terms of the writing of battles, a lot of reviews complain about his run-on sentences. Jeff, Jeff Shera uses a lot, and I mean a lot, of run-on sentences, most notably when he's writing a battle or any bit of action. And I personally love that depiction because to me it shows a continuous flow of action. You can follow it in your brain because you're, you're reading it continuously go. It doesn't stop. And Michael Shera did this too. And sometimes it leaves you out of breath if you're reading it. Like the sentences go on for so long that sometimes you're like, oh my God, it's still going. It's still going. And, and why that works is because that's what your character is feeling. But this also sort of kicks off an arc for Lee that I really enjoy. And that's losing his commanders and taking more and more responsibility onto himself. And it shows how much his men also love him. We know that his men love him, right? Within the last full measure. And especially if you've read Gods and Generals and the Killer Angels beforehand, you know his men love him. But if you haven't, you've just picked up the, la um, 
the last full measure and just decided to read that. The Battle of the Wilderness sequences not only shows that his men, it, it doesn't just tell you that his men love him, it shows you Lee to the rear, which is something that happened in the battle. Lee was going to lead a charge, and they said, we're not stepping a foot forward until you get back. <laughs> you know, his men said, no, we're not going anywhere until you get yourself to safety. This is our fight. This is our job. And it shows just how much devotion his men have without really needing to outright say it. And that's good writing, in my humble opinion. And I won't lie, I actually cheered. I can't believe I did it, but it's like, I know this happens because I know the history, but like, I actually cheered when Longstreet showed up. You know, the, the his old Lee's old war horse arriving at the last moment to sort of save, quote unquote, save the day and push the Union back. I could tell it's a good book when I'm actually on the edge of my seat, even though I know exactly what's going to happen when I'm on the edge of my seat and I can't stop reading. It also, there's a great harrowing moment depicting the fires afterwards because those killed more people than the actual battle itself. The wounded left in the wilderness as the wilderness caught on fire. And them screaming and dying and burning to death. There's one, and this is an example of a minor nameless private sort of appearing just to capture a moment that isn't that works narratively. There's a one Confederate soldier who shoots his friend who had been wounded so that his friend doesn't burn to death. It's a really good scene. And I think it's one of those examples that it's it's good that this is a nameless character. It doesn't really flow from or detract from the overall narrative. It adds to it. There's also the Battle of the Crater, which is interesting. Because the Battle of the Crater is quite well written, despite the fact that there's no real POV of the battle itself. It's just an amalgamation of different POVs. And Shara instead describes the chaos and violence, painting an overall picture of utter horror, which is exactly what the Battle of the Crater was. It paints it as cathartic for the Confederate soldiers, but also showing how barbaric they let themselves become as well, because like in the moment, the Confederates just pour out their anger in the Union that are trapped in this crater. They just can't stop. They let all of their furies and anger out. And then after it, you realize, what have we done? We've let our barbarism get the better of us, you know, and it's really wonderfully done. Lee is by far the most dynamic of the three characters within the last full measure. You know, the stress of fighting a lost cause that we see th from beginning of this book to the end. Uh, and, we, and basically, we are seeing the destruction of the Army of Northern Virginia as the book goes along. The slow delusionment of Lee, as well as time goes on, that constant hope that he has for a victory, and putting it in God's hands that God is somehow on the South's side and that God will make sure that they prevail. It shows that stubbornness in Lee, you know, clinging to a way of war, that just wasn't possible anymore. Him realizing that no Longstreet was right, Jackson was actually kind of wrong. That Jackson probably would have been a horrible thing for the second half of the war, but Longstreet's way is the correct way. Him realizing that and him going, I don't know how to fight this war anymore because it's not a way he was taught. That's a fascinating and dynamic character in my humble opinion. And Shara, he might be a little bit too idealistic of Lee, showing a more romanticized version of who General Lee was for some readers. But an example being um, why Lee didn't attend the surrender ceremonies himself. It does show Appomattox, but, you know, Gordon being saluted by Chamberlain and all that. Shara gives the excuse that Lee didn't attend that surrender because Lee in the book explains that he'd just get in the way. In reality, it was probably more likely that it would have been rubbing salt in a wound, and quite frankly, Lee was beaten, and he was rather salty over that. He was. I don't really blame him. <laughs> you know, I'm not dissing his character, but that's probably more of the reason why he didn't attend the surrender ceremony more than him getting in the way, quote unquote. But him seeing all those who he cared about, all of his generals that he genuinely likes, most notably Jeb Stewart and Longstreet, those two, slowly getting horribly mutilated because of the battle, you know, getting wounded and stuff like that, or die one by one. It's tough. And Lee does a good job, and Jeff Sher, I should say, does a good job at describing Lee and the reactions that it gives to Lee. Namely, Stuart, who is quite close with Lee, um, as established in Gods and Generals and a bit in The Killer Angels. Lee, when he learns of the, his death at, I believe, Yellow Tavern, um, even he didn't die at Yellow, Yellow, Yellow Tavern, but Jeb Stuart was shot at Yellow Tavern. Lee breaking down and crying as he learns of Stuart's death afterward, it honestly almost moved me to tears. 
because I cared enough. I cared that Lee cared. And it's so wonderfully written. It's so beautifully presented that you can literally viscerally picture it in your head it's like a movie. It's almost like a script itself. And all of that is thanks to Jeff Shera's writing. Uh, and it was the moment, this, this part here where Lee breaks down and cries thinking of Jeb Stewart, it was the moment I said, this is my favorite book of all time because I was so moved by that scene. There's also the destruction of the Stonewall Brigade, uh, which is another turning point for General Lee, too. Throughout this book, Lee keeps sort of reminiscing about Stonewall and how much he misses having Jackson by his side, especially after Gettysburg. You know, it's done deliberately in a reaction to the events that happened in the Killer Angels. So suddenly we have this scene which showcases the destruction of the Stonewall Brigade, Jackson's original brigade he commanded, and it's wonderfully written, and it goes to Lee's point of view. What happens here is Jeff Sherry uses a bit of symbolism. This shows the, the death of his ideal mythology behind Jackson and his acceptance that Jackson isn't here anymore. That the way of war that Jackson had fought no longer is a thing. And he needs to understand that. It's wonderfully done. And again, it's a usage of historical events to progress your, your character arc. To progress your, your story. As for Grant, you know, he is the modern general compared to the more aristocratic eloquence of General Lee. Uh, you know, plays him as extremely stoic, but an eternal sensitive man. He's a very sensitive guy, that, but he's just very good at hiding it. In many cases, it's him wanting to explode in anger because of the incompetence that he runs into in, with the Army of the Potomac. But unlike Meade, who explodes all the time with anger, Grant can hold it in. And that's partially what makes him an effective leader. So while Lee's character arc begins with the Battle of the Wilderness, Grant's actually begins after Cold Harbor, the Battle of Cold Harbor. And he sees, in particular, there's this one scene, and I don't know if this happened in reality or not, but whatever the case, the scene is extremely effective in the book. He sees a dying soldier and locks eyes with him, Grant. And Grant, in that moment, realizes that his anger towards his generals and everything like that it wasn't worth it. The buck stopped with him. It is his fault these thousands of men have died. And it's the beginning of a shift in tactics. He blames himself, which is a wonderful character trait. And Shara uses this as a catalyst for the Siege of Petersburg. Again, an event carrying things over, going from point A to point B, then making logical sense and linking together to create a narrative. It's wonderful. That is what historical fiction should be in what this does in droves. So note the character development leading to historical events. With Lee, we have a historical event that leads to character development. In this, we have character development leading to historical events. I love it, guys. This is why I love Jeff Shera so much, is because he does shit like this. He does it more times than not. Also, Grant's scenes with, with Lincoln are quite touching. There's multiple of them throughout it. And the idealism is what keeps Grant going because he's suffered loss after loss after loss at the hands of General Lee. And General Lee did. He beat Grant several times in 1864 leading into 1865. That's one reason why Petersburg had to become a thing. And every time it's like Lincoln shows up, it's almost like it, it breathes a can of fresh air into or, or rejuvenates Grant in some way. And that's what I really like. And Another scene where we have that is, and that's extremely touching to me, the scene where he reunites with Sherman for the first time towards the end of the war. And it's just really nice. They, they hug each other, and it feels earned. Even though we don't really know who Sherman is, we do get the inner monologues of Grant and how much he misses Sherman. He misses having him by his side now that he's out in the East. He's so used to fighting in the West, suddenly this e the East side of the battle is like this whole new alien world to to Grant and how he misses Sherman. And that feels sort of cathartic that they finally get to meet each other. Even though it's a short scene, it's it's really touching and I really like it. And I could picture it happening in my brain as well. It's just so wonderfully written and so simple and it's so in character for Grant. And I also admire that despite the fact that they are fighting each other, it really dives into the reverence Grant has for Lee but it also shows that Lee doesn't really have the same reverence for Grant. And the book does play that up a little bit. But Grant really respects the fuck out of Lee. And not just because he's a worthy adversary. It's because of who Lee is. Grant referring to Lee often as him. Instead of saying his name is a nice little character thing that sort of pops up throughout the book. How Grant never really likes to say his name. 
what Jeff Shera nails most about Grant is Grant's understanding of how to best beat Lee. And that is, well, just that. We need to beat Lee. This is how you're going to win the war. Not by taking Richmond. They're just going to move their capital elsewhere. You need to destroy the army. And the book really is good at capturing that mentality with Grant. And one scene um, after the Battle of the Wilderness is actually really touching because it's established in Gods and Generals. Longstreet and Grant were actually really close friends at West Point. They knew each other. They liked each other a lot. Uh, They were good friends. And Grant learns that at the Battle of Wilderness that Longstreet was horribly wounded. And Grant is internally extremely hurt by this because Longstreet is a friend. But then very coldly, Grant turns on the logical side of his brain, which is what he tends to do throughout this book. He says he will do it again in a heartbeat. I will not stop. Even though you are my friend, Longstreet, I will not stop until you are defeated. And it's very cold, and especially compared to Lee, who is very eloquent, very warm, very gentle. Grant is not. Grant is very cold, calculating, which is partially partially why I think he was the best decision to win the war. Uh, So it's also historically accurate. And I really like that moment. I think it's really good at establishing who Grant was and is in terms of the narrative itself. Grant is extremely cold compared to Lee, very angry, very practical, very aware of what is happening. Now, that is compared to Lee, who starts off that way as being very practical, knowing what he needs to do. But as the book goes along and the war situation for the Confederacy just gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, Lee suddenly grows more delusional over the rebels' ability to fight and achieve a victory. And that's the only way that I could really describe it. It's this hope for a victory. You can hope for victory, but hope doesn't mean make it so. And that's General Lee. Now Chamberlain, who is the third and final main POV of the of the book, and so he is actually probably a better case for the northern perspective on the war in terms of its morals, in terms of the ideals, in terms of why we are fighting this war. And that really, of course, started with the Killer Angels, don't get me wrong. And that kind of rounds out what these characters are. So you have Lee, who is the southern perspective on the war, the southern POV. Albeit, it does kind of lean rather heavily on the lost cause myth. Now, Grant, on the other hand, is the military perspective on the war. Very cold, very calculated, as I've established before. But Chamberlain is the moral righteousness of the war against the South. He's certainly the most anti-slavery parts of the book are from Chamberlain's point of view. And that stance comes almost solely from Chamberlain, that we are in the right, which the the North was, we are in the right, we are here to fight to set other men free. And you get why people loved him so much. And I, I just don't understand this modern historiography on him, but the speech we see him give before the Second Battle of Petersburg is truly a rousing speech. You feel your heart pumping as Chamberlain gives it, because when Chamberlain is speaking it, you suddenly realize Chamberlain believes what he's saying in this scene, and therefore his men start believing it. It's also Chamberlain, you know, one of the saviors of Gettysburg, or, you know, quote-unquote. Almost like a completion of his character from in this trilogy, right? Because in Gods and Generals, you have the real sentimental and kind of naive Chamberlain, like, come right, coming into his own and really being baptized by fire at Fredericksburg. And then reality setting in is the Killer Angels. Him realizing just, no, this is what we need to do, this is how we're going to do it, very kind of turns him into a leader, quote-unquote, is what is in the Killer Angels. And now it is rousing and inspiring within the last full measure. So it's a really cool arc that happens from Gods and Generals to the third book. And it's it's really, it's, I can't say it enough, it's really well done. And all three of these characters sort of come together at Appomattox, which I think is genius. And Chamberlain saluting Gordon, a really, really touching scene. Grant being the main perspective uh, at Appomattox as well. What happens inside that courthouse where they're signing the treaties and writing everything else. The fact that it's from Grant's POV, I think is unbelievably fitting. And I think was absolutely 100% the right decision made by Jeff Shera because I think it fits Grant more that we be in his head as not just a victor, but also showing what kind of man Grant has become from the beginning of the book, where he was extremely cold and calculated and angry. Now suddenly he's like, no, now's the time not to be angry and cold and full of retribution, or crying for retribution, I should say. Now's the time for healing. 
all those talks with Lincoln that he's had prior to this moment are now paying off. Again, the genius of the narrative structure that Jeff Shera chose in writing The Last Full Measure is why that works so well and why that fits so well. You know, it also parallels, you know, with his first scene with Lincoln. Grant first meets Lincoln and he is wearing a torn up uniform because he didn't really have time to get his luggage over there and to change, covered in mud. And Lincoln actually likes that about him. Now Grant has to meet with Lee and the same thing happened. He's wearing a raggy uniform that is covered in mud. You know, he has a killer headache. You have Lee who is eloquently dressed, almost comically so. The contrast could not be more prevalent. And I think it's just such a good scene to show the differences between the old way of war and this new way of war. My only complaint I kind of touched on before with The Last Full Measure is that we needed more emphasis on slavery. Gods and Generals has this problem as well, though I want to say this, it is nothing like the movie. In fact, I think only 10% of the book, Gods and Generals, is actually in the movie, Gods and Generals. They are two radically different things. But that being said, I, I do think some readers might find it a little too lost cause based in its approach, but mainly I think that's just because it's trying to tell an even perspective of the war. The Killer Angels is all more about the tactics and stuff like that and the horrors of war in this era of fighting. Not so much the case with Gods and Generals. But the overall arcing theme that you can see throughout this trilogy, and I think it was really started with Michael Shera, and Jeff Shera kind of adopted it, is why do good men fight? And I know uh, the director of Gods and Generals in Gettysburg, Ron Maxwell, has said that multiple times and that he really tried to capture that. And I think he succeeded in droves in Gettysburg, but kind of failed in Gods and Generals. Both Shera's, Michael Shera and Jeff Shera, overwhelmingly succeeds. And it all accumulates in the last full measure in such a beautiful and touching way. Oh, it was so worth reading. I mean, this to me is like the perfect historical fiction novel. Uh, it's got the right amount of action, right? The character development and changing is working in tandem with the history itself, which is important when you're telling historical fiction. And the history is not dictating the character like we get in some of his other books. It's, it's working hand in hand with the history, which is a lot more difficult than you think it would be. And it is perfectly paced and balanced in its perspectives. You care about these people. You want to know what's coming next. You want to keep turning that page to keep the story going. And you understand them. I think that is a wonderful, a wonderful gift that Jeff Shera and Michael Shera give us, is that through these historical, this historical fiction, it allows him and us to jump in the heads of these really important characters in history that shaped our history, American history in particular, and made it what it is and humanizes them. And I swear to God, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand on this hill and die on it. The Last Full Measure is the greatest book I have ever read. Oh, it was just so good. It was a total treat rereading this trilogy. I have not read the prequel book, Gone for Soldiers, yet, but I do intend to check that out. I also have not read Jeff Shera's Revolutionary War duology as well, so I, I intend to pick those up as well. But right now I'm taking a break from Jeff Shera. Uh, I've had my fill of him for right now, so I'm going on other things, but uh, I do I do really want to talk about The Smoke of Dawn at some point, because that would be a an interesting sort of story to tell, I think. I, I highly recommend this book. I even recommend the audiobook. The audio, audiobook is pretty decent as well. Um, highly recommend it. Can't recommend it enough. It's my favorite fucking book of all time, so uh, not really going to pimp myself out. All of my social media and everything is all available in the description below. Till next time, guys. Take care.